All right, everybody. So here we're going to be ta talking about ecological networks. Now, um, for the basically purposes of this course, we're going to mostly be talking about food webs, but there are um, other types of ecological networks that you can more explore in your textbook. So um, when we think about food webs, oftentimes people think of, um, you know, basically a picture that's looking like this, where we have um, a bunch of different species eating other different species, okay? But there's really um, all sorts of ways that we can think about food webs, and they're really a flexible tool that we can do so, so many different things. So this is a picture of the um, table of contents of the journal food webs, okay? And if we see, we've got um, all sorts of very different types of articles. So livestock prevalence in the Egyptian vulture diet during European sanitary restrictions on carcass disposal, okay? So basically, um, how are ranchers getting rid of their dead cattle and dead livestock and how that's affecting um, a type of vulture, right? So it's uh, looking at a single species and what it's eating and where it's getting its food from. Then we've got green versus brown food web, effects of habitat type on multidimensional stability proxies for a highly resolved Antarctic food web, okay? So that's looking at um, the detritus and the algae derived food web, so that's the green and the brown, um, and looking at how that imparts stability on a food web. Okay, um, so this is looking at ecological re restoration in a forest. Um, let's see, and then this one is ungulate herbivores reduce food fruit production of shrubs in a dry coniferous forest in the interior Pacific Northwest. So this is basically looking at how deer are changing the um, the amount of fruit produced in a forest. So um, food webs, like just just looking at that um, table of context, we can we can see that you can use food webs in so many different ways. Um, one of the first ways that I want to talk about how we use food webs is looking at an energy flow diagram, okay? And oftentimes we think of this as an ecological pyramid, or um, maybe an older name for them is the Eltonian pyramids um, for the famous ecologist Elton. But what we see is pretty much in every food web, what we have is, well, I sh I, yes, in every food web, what you see is there are, um, as things get eaten at different trophic levels, or every time energy is transferred, you lose it. Okay, so this is analogous to uh, the heat coming off of your car engine, right? So we put in gas into a car so that we can have fuel to move the car forward, to uh, uh, take the potential energy of the fuel and turn it into kinetic energy of the car moving forward. But so much of that energy, um, somewhere around like 70 to 80 percent, is actually lost as heat. This is why your car has a radiator and this is why your engine gets hot, right? Um, now the same thing happens with organisms. Plants, ha this happens too, but you know, with um, animals I think it's easier to see, but as as an organism eats food, um, a lot of that food then is lost as metabolic heat. Um, a lot of that, the energy that was in that food just gets pooped out. Um, but on average, we see somewhere between 10 to 20 percent, so I have 15 percent here, actually goes into the biomass of the next trophic level. So if you look here where we have, um, this is looking at energy. The primary producers have 10,000 joules of energy. Now this is just, you know, kind of made up numbers here, but what we see is here we have, when we go to those grasshoppers, if those grasshoppers eat those plants, we only have about a thousand joules of primary consumers, those herbivores, okay? And each time you go up a level, each time energy is transferred, you lose a t bunch of energy due to that metabolic heat and the just pooping out of the waste materials, right? So um, what we see is the, um, in a normal, well, I shouldn't really say normal, in a average uh, terrestrial ecosystem, we see primary producers are in highest abundance, okay? And when we're, what we're talking about is energy here, okay? And because 
you know, if you all of a sudden reduce the amount of primary producers, that's going to necessitate the loss of biomass or energy at the next level above that. Okay, now that change might not happen immediately, but it, it, it will. So what's interesting is in aquatic food webs, we often see a flip. Um, so if you go to, you know, take a walk through any pretty much forest, what do you see? You see a whole bunch of plants, very few herbivores, and even fewer, fewer, fewer top carnivores. Okay, uh, you know, how often do you go see a fox or, um, you know, compared to how many squirrels that you see in a Wisconsin forest, right? Um, and that's due to that energy loss. But if you go to an aquatic food web, we see it very, very different. Um, if you go to a lake, you actually don't see that much algae, that standing biomass of algae. Now this is a, you know, a, a more pristine lake, not, not one that has a bunch of fertilizer in it, but um, you don't see that much algae. You see a whole lot of herbivores and a lot of carnivores. Now we don't really necessarily think of it in a Wisconsin lake, but bluegill, right? They're carnivores, right? They're actually at that, um, the primary carnivore level where Sorry, I have to sneeze. Okay, never mind. Um, so you have like algae, and, algae and macroinvertebrates eating those um, those algae, and then you have the bluegill at that primary carnivore level. Um, so you know, there's if you go in a lake and like, what's the most common fish around lakes around here in southeastern Wisconsin? It's probably bluegill, right? Um, and then you can even have a higher level of larger carnivores like uh, largemouth bass or northern pike or something. Um, and this is a little bit of a paradox because, you know, we, we just said that you have to have um, levels of, of uh, the, the amount of energy at, you know, a lower level has to be more than the next level. So when we see something like this, this might be a little bit confusing. But um, what that actually the the way we resolve that paradox is that um, the in aquatic food webs the producers are so tiny the algae um, if you look at the total amount of energy flowing through that trophic level at any given one day it's it's way 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 more uh, just because you know those those algae are reproducing several times a day and growing really really quickly now that standing crop of biomass in that primary producer level is eaten very quickly so we don't it doesn't seem like there's a lot of producers, but they just get um, eaten so fast, um, we don't see it. Even though like the whole total amount of energy flowing through that, that trophic level is, is higher. So if we look at like energy you in an aquatic food web, this is biomass, but if you look at like energy flowing through that, you would, you would still have a normal um, type of um, Eltonian pyramid that would look like this. So there's different ways that we can um, use food webs and depict food webs. And the first way I want to talk about that is what's called a source web. Okay. And this is uh, a source web is used to kind of explore uh, what different species eat a single food source. Okay. So coral, right? Um, coral are primary producers. We don't really think of them as primary producers, but remember they have that symbiotic algae, zooxanthellae, that live inside them that uh, create, you know, a lot of biomass and are doing, um, doing that photosynthesis. Um, but they're just housed inside the animal, the, the coral animal, right? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on coral right now, especially with coral bleaching and as we're losing uh, reefs all over the world. So source webs might be really, really interesting because if we want to try to protect coral, it, it's um, good to know what other species are actually using those coral. So this is an example of a, a source web and we can see that, you know, butterfly fish will nibble at the coral and eat them. Parrotfish have these, they're called parrotfish because of their beaks. They have these, these teeth that look like a parrot beak and they can bite off whole sections of coral, chew them up, and then they basically poop out sand. Um, crown of thorn starfish in the Pacific Northwest, um, or just in, in the Pacific, I should say, are, can be really 
eating a ton of coral and they just go along and uh, mow over whole coral and can eat them them very rapidly that so that's why i have this bigger thicker arrow here and nudibranchs they're these tiny little slugs that um kind of go along and eat um individual parts of the coral and um, can use their toxins and put them in their in their bodies and uh, really cool cool organisms but what this is showing is kind of like what is coral the source to right and to explore how coral are surviving and what's happening in them we really need to know well what what species are using them and how much and um, so we can understand the system so we can potentially manage the system so that we don't have uh, coral reefs just going away. Um, kind of a opposite of a, a source web is a sink web. Okay, so this is looking at what species are eaten by a single species. Okay, so let's say we want to look at um, a bald eagle. Okay, what do bald eagles eat? What you know they're a sink for energy, whereas coral was a source for energy for all of these things. The uh, bald eagle is a sink of energy coming from a lot of a lot of places. So they're going to be eating carrion. They're going to be we we generally think of bald eagles as hunting for these fish, right? Um, and lots of really cool pictures of eagles um, going after fish. Yes, they do that, but they also hunt ducks. Um, I've actually seen this. It's it's pretty amazing to uh, watch. But I was at a um, National Wildlife Refuge where these bald eagles would go in and these thousands of ducks and they would then get one and fight over it. It was really, really cool. But, um, you know, they're predators on a variety of different things. They can also eat trash alongside the road. They eat carrion alongside of the road all the time. So uh, there's th this might be really important looking at a sink web to figure out, um, you know, what are all the different food sources for a bald eagle? This is an endangered species that we really care about. That um, so, if we need, want to like figure out how to manage bald eagle populations, um, you know, this was particularly important through the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Now our bald eagle populations are doing a lot better. But if we want to manage those bald eagle populations, we need to understand what food sources they are using. And um, you know, we can't just manage bald eagles, we need to be managing their food sources too to get bald eagles. Uh, another example is looking at like Robert Payne's work, that idea of those keystone species and how, you know, all of these, this, this, that keystone species of that starfish can um, eat all of these different uh, species of barnacles and mollusks and snails and bivalves and all sorts of different things in the rocky intertidal zone. and we can see how this the sink web of all the energy that goes into starfish can moderate the whole uh, rocky intertidal system. So um, those are two, the source and the sink webs are two ways we can think of food webs. But um, most people, when they think about a food web, they think about a community web. So this is you know the classic diagram of where we have plants on the bottom and then herbivores and then carnivores and top bacteria or sorry top carnivores and then here we have uh, decomposers here as bacteria. It's interesting that they put the bacteria at the top, but um, you know maybe there should be another arrow going from the bacteria all the way back down to um, to the plants as as, as recycling. But um, you know. This is the classic uh, idea that we have of a food web. Um, and there's where all feeding relations, everything in the ecosystem can um, create the, the, the web that you see. Now there's three different ways to think about um, <coughs> uh, community webs or draw or depict them, I should say, maybe. Connect this webs, energy flow webs, and functional webs. Now, all three of these have different purposes and um, can be used in different ways. So let's let's look at a connectance web. Okay, so this is a classic picture of the North At Atlantic. It's this highly resolved food web where sh we have the entire North Atlantic ecosystem, and there's you know a whole bunch of species in here. And what a connectance web, so this is a classic depiction of a connectance web. All it shows is the links between species and the direction in which that link goes, okay? So who eats whom? Um, 
Uh, so what we have here is we have cod here in the middle and there's a whole lot of interactions here. I can't, you know, can't really even see it, but you know, cod are eating uh, mackerel. There's a line going from mackerel up to the cod. Now, um, what that what that's saying is that if you have a line going from an arrow going from one piece to the other, that's showing the direction of the energy flow. Um, I should say that you know, kind of throughout this whole lecture, I'm going to be talking about energy flowing, matter flowing. Uh, I'm going to be using those terms interchangeably. Really, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about energy, whether we're talking about carbon, whether we're talking about biomass. You know, it's just um, when one species e eats another, there's a flow of matter and energy going there. Um, so, you know, this is kind of what we generally think of as a connectance web. But uh, we'll spend some time uh, at the, you know, at the end of the food web section where we'll look at stable isotopes and how this is actually a connectance web and this little diagram showing all sorts of different um, species of fish here is actually a depiction of a connectance web. But connectance webs are showing who eats whom. Now, an energy flow web then is kind of like a step up more complicated than a connectance web. So it has all the information that a connectance web would but it adds the amount of energy flowing through those, those links, those interactions, okay? Um, and what we generally think of is the magnitude of flow is proportional to its importance, right? So, um, you know, what, we, what do we see here is um, an ant eating grass and a grasshopper eating grass. So how much of the, the energy in this grass is going to the ant versus the grasshopper? And what we see is it's actually you know, there's more, the grasshoppers are eating more of, of this grass because this arrow is thicker, right? Over here, we have a mouse maybe eating acorns off this oak tree and grasshoppers eating leaves and ants eating something on that tree, right? But, you know, from the ant's perspective, the ant gets a lot more of its energy from the grass as opposed to the, um, the, the, the oak tree here. So, um, these these energy flow webs are looking at the amount of energy flowing and and you know which takes a lot more work to do because you have to measure the amount of calories or measure how much plant biomass goes away or you know how many grasshoppers are eaten by robins compared to how many praying mantises compared to how many um, of of those other species. Now, a functional food web then is um, kind of like a third step of even more complicated. And what you do with a functional food web, uh, this idea was popularized, uh, popularized by Robert Payne. He was looking at the importance of species interactions determined by species removal, okay? So um, you basically build a uh, energy flow web and then what happens when you re physically remove a species? Now, if you uh, remember uh, Robert Payne's work, he was looking at um, uh, starfish, okay, and what happens when you actually remove that species? Does the ecosystem, the, the populations of everything else change? Um, so you can either do this physically like, like they did in the 60s or you can do this by uh, modeling things, right? So go out and build an energy food web and then take out this, this snake and see what happens, right? Well, according to this thing, right, the hawk essentially wouldn't have any more food. Um, so does the hawk die off? Um, you know, how important is the snake for regulating mouse populations? Um, you know, if you remove this snake, the mouse populations super increase and hawk populations just decrease. You know, that, that would, might be what you expect. What happens when you move, remove this grasshopper, right? Does the mouse end up getting, eating more acorns from the oak tree? Um, does the robin have to make up by eating more um, more ants and more praying mantises. So, you know, uh, it's a functional web is kind of like taking out species piecemeal to see how, what, you know, how important it is. If you take out a species and a whole bunch of stuff changes, that's going to make a much bigger impact. So what we see is most webs contain um, relatively few, like big arrows, strong interactions and a whole lot of weak links, which we will um, 
explained by like these these thin arrows. Um, and we see those keystone species are those species that are connected by those big, strong, strong, thick arrows. Um, but uh, we'll talk a little bit about, about uh, food web stability later on, but we can hint at it here is the more weak links you have, that can actually stabilize the community because while here, um, you know, the mouse is eating a whole lot of grasshoppers, um, the the uh, this link that the since the mouse can eat you know acorns from this oak tree if the grass grasshopper pop population fluctuates the additional food sources from that oak tree might be able to stabilize that mouse population so what we see is weak links often have the ability to stabilize the community so um, what what is interesting is um, the resolution of food webs, whether we're talking about a functional web, an energy flow web, or a connectance web, is really um, very uh, inconsistent, okay? Because every researcher has some sort of time and money restriction, and uh, every researcher has some uh, uh, specialty in a specific area. So what we oftentimes see is uh, food webs are like aggregated, lumped together more at the bottom of the food web. So this is an example here where apparently this looks like it was um, a food web created by, this is just a connectance web now, by uh, an ornithologist, some person that was looking at um, uh, seabirds and what we see is like you know a puffin a little auk these are species of birds a uh, glaucous gull um, I don't even know what that is but it looks like some sort of seagull right um, but you know they have plants as one uh, one thing worms as one whole box but there's probably hundreds of species of worms here um, how many species of algae are in this system how many species of diptera those are um, you know two winged flies but then we have a whole box for the polar bear. Now, um, you know, marine animals, like that, that, that's a huge box, right? So um, is it fair to really show this thing, this, this food web, when we don't know the importance of all of these different species compared to other boxes in here? Um, so, you know, and, and what we generally see is uh, People that work with food webs aggregate more as they get towards the bottom of the food web. So primary producers might be lumped in as like terrestrial plants and aquatic algae or something. Um, even though those those uh, those that trophic level probably is more diverse. And then you know if you look in this whole thing, there are no parasites. Well, there's certainly going to be uh, you know fleas and on the polar bear and there's going to be lice on the birds so um, you know all sorts of you know interior exterior parasites that are in here that are actually in this food web that are not um, not shown here uh, and that that's because you know uh, the parasites are just difficult to identify right um, and then we have no um, cannibalism here. Um, you know, I'm not really sure. Let's see what species would here be doing uh, um, cannibalism. A lot of the protozoas would, um, you know, Arctic foxes are not going to be eating each other. But um, fish do this all the time. And it, oftentimes when we have um, food webs with a bunch of fish species, it's rarely ever um, discussed about cannibalism of the older ones eating the younger ones. So food webs are often just really the predator-prey perspective. They omit things like mutualism, commensalism, competition, and amensalism. All of those um, y things you can put in a food web, but um, really classically when we think about um, food webs, they're oftentimes not even considered at all. So when you look at a food web, just you know, take it with a grain of salt. There uh, is more things going on that can have an impact on the different species. All right, with that, uh, I will catch up by looking at um, other aspects of food webs and how to measure things about food webs in a little bit.